Now we're going to talk about paying for it, managing preservation funding. So we're going to hear from Ms. Chris Keegan, has over 40 years of experience with the Washington State Department of Transportation. Chris was the first chair of the Western Bridge Preservation Partnership. Please welcome Chris. The first thing I got to do is tell you that uh, I'm not talking about how to deal with an influx of funds right away. That'll be at the end. What I really want to do is talk about how you get to the funding at the end. That is by developing a bridge asset management plan and how we're doing it in Washington State, because we're not quite there yet. And we have some help. And one of the things, and all the things I did between the Bridge Preservation Expert Task Group, my work with the uh, Western Bridge, uh, the Subcommittee on Maintenance, now called the Maintenance Committee, is that when you do all this work and you develop something, use it. So one of the things Federal Highways came out with was an update to the Bridge Preservation Guide, which you all got a copy. What I did is I took the guide, and then I went back and looked at one of the ways we are doing preservation, something we've been doing probably for the longest amount of time, and that is our bridge washing program. And then looked in, if you go to page 13, if you have your book, kind of gives you how you do it from step one all the way to step 11. So I try to fit all those steps together and fit it in with our bridge washing program. So the number one step was you have to have some goals and objectives. The ones we had for bridge cleaning, first, first thing you have to do is you have to get permits, all your environmental permits. You have to have money to do it. Part of that is we also want to, if you go to a bridge and you clean it and it's got a bird problem, you're just wasting your time. So you have to control the birds. Uh, what I didn't realize when I gave him an estimate of what it was going to cost is the equipment. So you can't forget the equipment. So we needed to buy two underbridge, underbridge inspection trucks. Our goal was to clean all our steel trusses once a year. Number one is really we wanted to remove a Federal Highways letter of concern of inadequate fracture critical inspection due to debris buildup on truss bridges. And we wanted uh, for our maintenance crews to be able to to clean the steel, to allow for spot and area painting, to extend paint life. And we're hoping keeping our steel trusses clean may reduce in the long term the cost of future paint contracts. Bridges to preserve, we prioritize them. Number one was our steel trusses. We wanted to focus on those first. And then we want to move on to bridges with uh, in-span hinges, add in weathering steel, and then add in the rest of the steel bridges. If you notice, we haven't hit our concrete bridges yet because the amount of money isn't anywhere near enough to do all that we want to do. What we're allowed to do as far as our permits go, first of all, we must hand clean our bridges first, use a high volume, low pressure flush. Another thing we want to do, as Dwayne wants us to do, is seal all the panel points on the bridge, all the joints, because if they continue to leak onto the bridge, you're kind of wasting your time. We want to spot an area paint as, as needed. We want to include cleaning decks, drainage, pier caps, everything else while you're there. Make sure you have bird control on the bridge. Here's what one looks like, kind of a before and after picture, not exactly in the same place. Tough to get my maintenance people to focus on one spot, but it's, this is the same bridge done at the same time. And as uh, I think Dwayne pointed out, uh, we don't have near enough money to paint all our bridges. So he's looking towards maintenance to help extend the life of the paint and the bridge. This is on the Deschutes River Bridge, 507 of a 114. Uh, what we did is we cleaned the bridge, we treated the rust, and then we overcoated it. Unique thing about this bridge, it was built in 1943. We had a war going on. Steel was at a premium at the time. So what we did is we took parts of the Galloping Gertie, the bridge that failed, and this bridge is some of the relics of that bridge. It's an artifact but we don't tell anybody that. Otherwise, it'd be a historic bridge. We can't do anything with it. As Herbert, as you caught me in the hallway, you're going to talk about all this additional funding after Dwayne tells a sad sob story about he can only do one bridge overlay. We can't do all this stuff. All of that's true, but I don't know if Dwayne remembers, but we didn't paint bridges for seven, eight, nine years. It was so bad that all of our paint contractors went out of business. So now our paying contractors come from places like Florida, the Midwest somewhere, you know, it's as long as we weren't feeding them projects, uh, they could no longer do work. Also, what he didn't point out is that we didn't do any deck overlays for a very long time. One of the reasons why maintenance was spending about 90% on the east side just patching decks. 
because they had already reached the end of their life for those overlays, and they were going out there as firemen, putting out the fires, patching the decks. Now we're actually doing some, not nearly enough to get all that we need to do in a timely manner. We like to do our trusses about every 20 years, uh, steel girders and so on about every 30 to 40. Performance measures, what we have is percent of steel truss bridges cleaned annually. We want to remove the FHW letter of concern. We want to continue with our contract with USDA to remove pigeons from our bridges, reduce the bird damage. We want to be able to purchase the two ubits and reduce the paint backlog. As far as life cycle plans, again, I'm using that circle there of all the things you're supposed to do and paint the bridges as needed. Again, these are the numbers from our gray notebook. Evaluation of the benefits for our bridge washing program. We received a letter from Federal Highways praising our truss cleaning program. Once clean, most of the trusses stayed relatively clean. Over on the east side, we have some bridges that they looked at and they figured they didn't need to clean again. So they'll just evaluate those on an annual basis. Efficiency, the crews got better and better and also was less material on the bridges. The very first bridge we cleaned took two weeks. That same bridge, they can do two a day. Same type of bridge. The cleaning permit that we had just for the state to use is now extended to all the public agencies in the state. Paint backlog is declining. It may have just been a short-term thing. Not sure, Duane, but from what the gray notebook, it did show a, a drop. We're checking on spot painting e efficacy. What we've been doing, especially on the ones that have been recently painted under contract, is to make sure if there's any holidays, anything like that, any chips, that we coat those. Checking on uh, our panel joint seals. One thing we found is the hot mix asphalt seals on those don't seem to work too well, so we're removing all those. Putting in some backer rod and sealer on those, we think that'll work better. Funds, we got, uh, I was asked after Skagit River failed, okay, Chris, how much is gonna cost to uh, start a bridge cleaning program? So. I answered right away, two million bucks. So that's what we got. What I didn't figure in was the cost of the U-Bitch were 625,000 a piece. So that takes a big chunk of them. Kind of delayed our program a little bit. But this, uh, for 1719, about $80 million for paint funding. Again, I got that out of the great notebook. And we got uh, from maintenance, $6 million of preservation funds to uh, help get caught up on repairs we have to do do some deck seals, do some other things, some preservation type work. Another thing that uh, Wayne didn't mention is that we have one of the highest gas taxes in the United States. Uh, California's ahead of us. I think Hawaii is ahead of us. Uh, I think we're number four. But one of the things that, the reason why Dwayne didn't have any money was all the nine and a half cent and the nickel that we got before were all directed towards projects, nothing towards preservation funds. So really no money for doing any paints, paint jobs, any deck repair, that sort of thing. And there's eight cents for preservation, maintenance, safety repairs, all that statewide. 11 cent of the money goes to cities and counties. And at this point, four cents was going to just pay off debt. And as the head of our department, Roger Millar, is always pointing out to the legislature that we're only funded for 50% of our preservation needs, even with the 49 half cent gas tax, uh, and on top of that, a lot of that money is now going to build t changing culverts into bridges with about 800 new fish passage barriers that we're gonna replace with bridges. We have a bridge maintenance backlog. All of the repairs we're supposed to be doing has increased 400% over the last 10 years. Because of all those deck repairs the uh, east side is doing, they don't have time to do anything else. For the next 10 years, billion dollars needed for bridge decks, 711 million needed for bridge replacement, 777 million needed for bridge painting. So we're, we have nowhere near that kind of money. Bridge maintenance has been getting, gaining some money. We got the $2 million a number of years ago for the bridge cleaning. Strategic preservation funds that we got at the beginning of this biennium, $6 million spread it out through the state. We got two new crews with uh, equipment, a million dollars of that came from our maintenance funds. Plus that, we also got surprised midway through this last biennium. Maintenance engineer, the state, also had a $2 million slush fund from connecting Washington to do all kinds of maintenance stuff. But he didn't want to spend it right away, so he pocketed it for the first year. But one of the things that our maintenance crews are very good at is 
practical solutions. Part of that new uh, 14 point something cents we got and the fact that we're, we're underfunded in bridge preservation is they're saying that any savings that we get through practical design would go to preservation. I'm not sure if we have any of those that have actually uh, produced any funds yet. But maintenance is very good at practical solutions. Uh, I would like to cover a couple of those. One is that uh, lights scare, scare away starlings. Tacoma Narrows Traveler, cold expansion, which Diana, Diana uh, covered earlier. Timber Bridge Life Extension, joint replacements. You know, generally your preservation stuff is going to add to the life of your bridges. You're going to save money. We had a problem with starlings. If I don't know if you, if you guys can see that, but that's a, a lift bridge. Those are the cables on top. The reason why it looks fuzzy, those are starlings coming to roost at the end of the day. Somewhere 10, 20,000 birds coming to roost on this one bridge. If you look at the stairs going down, that's all bird poo. And this crew cleans that fairly often because it gets real slippery and wet and it's just nasty. A couple Christmases ago, one of the maintenance folks up there said, you know, I wonder if putting some lights up in these towers might deter the bir birds. So he went down to uh, Walmart, bought a string of Christmas lights, the clear ones, put them up in there, turned them on, and the birds didn't roost that, that night. He says, huh, this looks like it's working. So he went out and bought some more, put it in the other tower. Next thing they know, no birds on that side either. So they changed out the incandescent bulbs with LEDs. They put a photo sensor on it, and this thing goes on at night. The birds don't come back. They clean the bridge. Here's the lights. See how nice and clean it is underneath there. No more problem. Cost to the state was 200 bucks. Now that's a real good solution because we tried everything else. Nothing else worked. TNBE Travelers, a practical solution. Dwayne had in his budget $12.5 million for Travelers for the old Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Talking to the maintenance people, they did not need Travelers. On the new bridge, they have Travelers. You can only carry 500 pounds on those, and those travelers are very maintenance intensive. So basically, they're nothing more than taxis back and forth. So if you want to do any painting job, you need a paint platform. And the contractor actually left us with about close to 90% of the material we needed, a Safeway platform that we could use. So we contracted with a Safeway company. They came up with a platform cost us for everything they did about $125,000. So rather than $12.5 million expended, it's uh, 125, except we had such a good surplus, I also got a slurry blaster, compressor, and a few other things to go with it. So a real bargain to the state. One thing I tell the bridge crews all the time is my DDDS. Don't do dumb stuff. Because, and one of the, the dumb things we used to do is crack the rest holes. We would go out, and the Squally River Bridge is one, built in 1937, the uh, stringers, the girders, whatever you call them on there, had reached the fatigue life, they were cracking. We would go out there, follow the inspectors right behind them, put in the crack of rest holes, and then the next time it was inspected, we'd be right back there chasing the crack. When I found out about the cold expansion, we started using it. We've used it 120 or so times. We've had two failures. We're not chasing the crack anymore. So we're not doing the dumb stuff anymore. This works. So we've been doing it for about five years now, and so far it works out. Worked out well enough that our very conservative bridge office gave us a set of plans right here on how to do the work. But of course, they're very uh, safety conscious, so it's, we usually do belt and suspenders. So once we do that, we also plate the thing. If it's, I think it says more than a four inch crack, I think, we put a plate over it. And here's one of the befores. This was a crack arrest hole on it that didn't last. That was like, within two years, we went and put the crack arrest hole in it. Smart things we're doing is we're doing, starting to do deck seals. We hadn't done that before. Our bridge crew being fairly smart, thought five gallon buckets to spread uh, the grid on the deck it was awful labor intensive. So they went out and bought one of the sand salt spreaders, put on the back of the pickup truck, saved a lot of back wear and tear, made a nice spread on the, the sand for the, the epoxy. 
I'm a believer in bore ray rods. When I started over 40 years ago with the state of Washington, they told me, don't worry about timber bridges. We have a plan. The plan is within 10 years, all the timber bridges will be gone. 40 years later, I think we have about 97 left. The good thing about timber bridges is they can be fixed. Maintenance likes to do it. It's fairly, you know, it's, it's work that they can go in and do something about and they can get a result. What we've also determined is use of bore rods. These have been used in industry for a very long time. We didn't use them because our bridges weren't going to have to last very long. But now we've started using it. We notify our bridge inspectors where we put them. Where whenever we find any rod in these things, we'll go out there and we'll put the bore rate rods in. Some of these have been there long enough. We need to check them because they should last about 10 years before they need replacing. And basically, they're, uh, it's bore rate. It's in a solid form. They're activated at the same moisture content, what causes the rot thrives on. Put them about six to eight inches apart. Uh, if you want to accelerate, you have the liquid first, and then you, you put the rods in. And here they are putting the rods. You drill the holes, hammer those things in, put a plug in it, and you're good. And these, I threw all this in to show all the many different ways that you can extend the life. We do use a lot of steel. Some of those, we encapsulate the cap. It's big right there. This helps us to lift the bridge enough to get the... We encapsulate the caps here. This way we don't have to deal with traffic. We don't have to pull anything out or anything like that. Here we found out that our old growth that worked, that lasted 40 years, we put a new timbers in there, new creosote treated ones. Six months later, the inspector said they are split open. So then we came back in and we built this out of steel. We galvanized it. Uh, here we put steel to replace the timber. This is also a, was a timber leg, we made it steel. And here we, uh, we wrapped it in fiberglass and we pumped it full of epoxy. And this is one, uh, the, this span is getting replaced for the timber. And we're gonna take this and test it and uh, I think Oregon's gonna squash it for us. So we'll see how strong it is. Dwayne gave us eight, $6 million 18 months ago, thereabouts. We got informed by that it was a go about May of the year. Our, uh, Two-year cycle starts in July, so we had to come up with uh, what we were going to do, plan for getting new crews in place, equipment, and all that in about two months. And that wasn't very much fun. One of the superintendents said that if he knew how hard it was going to be, he would have quit on the spot. One of them quit after six months, a guy in the Northwest. So it was an awful lot all at once. That's the, when you get money all at once. How do you do it? But in my 40 years of being with the state of Washington, it's always, you're accelerating as fast as you can, and then you're braking as hard as you can. It's just a continuous cycle of push as hard as you can, and then brake as hard as you can. I said, we're running out of money, you gotta stop spending money, or we got all this money, you gotta spend it. Uh, as of 18 months, we'd spent uh, a little over 3.7 million of the funds, of the six million. Uh, the maintenance crews had completed 231 projects. Now of that, there was a little over a mile of joint that was replaced. 5,619 square feet of deck got repaired. 539,000 plus square feet of deck was sealed. We removed 135 repair list projects, or complete with P2 funds, out of those 231. And really good news for us, since we hired people for two of our crews, program has been extended through 2027. That's about uh, I forget, six or so, 36 million bucks. So how many decks did he give up for us to, to do that? So you're getting a lot of work done from us. Some of our lessons learned, first of all, it is difficult to hire, train, and equip new crews and have them to be effective and efficient from day one, even if we had more time than the two months we had before to get, get things going. We really did need more time to develop a better list of projects. Part of what we tried to work out with our regional crews is to come up with well-defined units. When you say deck repair on the Lake Washington Ship Canal Bridge, which is huge, that's a forever project. So you never, you can start, but you'll never end. So we need to better define the units on that. What I did when, in my region is I spent the money first, the preservation funds, fast as I could, hoping that any money left over we could use, which we did. And there was a reduction in uh, expenditures and other funding budgets due to lack of resources. Putting the effort into the P2 funds, our maintenance funding actually went down. In the Northwest, they got told they couldn't hire people last summer. 
and they were down eight bridge techs. So all during our peak period, they had nobody to expend those funds. The Northwest had thought about it a little more because we did have the P2 funds and they weren't really expending them. They could have charged those people out to that, but it didn't happen. Some of the lessons learned over time. Do you have any questions? Chris, could you expand on the USDA funding for bridge cleaning for <clears throat> bird? What? Yeah, we contract with the U.S. Department of Agriculture for $250,000 per year. And they go out and they look at all the bridges that we designate that we know have problems with pigeons, starlings, birds that we are allowed to touch. We also have things like cormorants because they are a migratory bird species. We can't touch those. We can't touch swallows, certain things like that. But pigeons and starlings are open game. So the USDA is providing funding to? No. Their... We provide the funding. Okay. They provide the people to go out and remove them with. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Now I understand. Yeah. Oh, did I tell you the story? I think I told the first time we used them over in the Tri-Cities area. And uh, they went out there and they seeded where, they, first of all, they put little transponders on the birds, find out where they're feeding. And so they went out and seeded where the grain silos are. This was a little bit slow acting stuff. So the birds had a chance to get back to the bridges where they roost. On Saturday morning, the bridge maintenance uh, guy out there had this panic call that there were tens of thousands of dead pigeons all over the road. And it was slick and messy. And what the hell happened? <laughs> so six 10-yard dump trucks, front-end loaders, and stuff later, they pretty well had it cleaned up. You're talking about the, the borate rods and uh, timber piles. Um, have you thought about whether that washes into due to rain and whatnot into the water? Yeah, that's one of the things. You don't use it where you have in the water, but outside the water, caps are a perfect place to use it. Uh, if you have piles that are on the land, you can use it. Because they're water soluble, it just flushes out if you put them in the water. It's pretty toxic at 16 ppm. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.